blessing upon the time together this morning. We ask, Lord Jesus, that <clears throat> the Holy Spirit would do what only the Holy Spirit can do, and that's to teach our hearts. I pray that we've come with softened hearts, teachable hearts, humble hearts. And Lord, we long to hear from you this morning, not from me. So, Father, use me as a vessel. Speak through me, but instruct these, your children. And help us to grow in such a way that we would bring you glory. And we pray for the other Bible-believing churches around the tri-state area, Father, asking your blessing upon them to strengthen your children wherever they may be. Help us to be mighty warriors for the cross. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we are looking at 1 Peter and developing a Christ-like character. We've been looking at that now for a couple of, or a few weeks, a couple weeks. This morning we'll finish up, if you will, on the introduction. But I want to read those first 11 verses of 2 Peter again as a groundwork. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And now for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence knowledge and in your knowledge self-control and in your self-control perseverance and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither youth, useless or unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Peter, the apostle Peter, wrote this. And he wrote this knowing that his death was imminent, that very soon he would lay aside this earthly tabernacle, if you will, that he was dwelling in. You find that in verse 14. And that he was going home to be with his Lord and Savior. And so in this epistle here, Peter writes, exhorting almost like, on a deathbed, you know, where a father talks to his children and tells them what he really desires of them. You know, maybe like walk with God, make sure you love your mother and take care of her. And on and on that list might go. But here's Peter, and he goes through all these things, and he ends this epistle with this. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Some people grow in knowledge, but they never grow in grace. Some people give a lot of grace, but they, they don't have any knowledge. Jesus was full of truth and love, truth and love. And those things work well together and, and are necessary for balance. And so it is that uh, grace and knowledge 
we have to operate, if you will, out of that which we know, but we operate in an attitude and spirit of grace, knowing that the same grace has been shown to us. And so we're going to pick up where we left off. We were looking last week at reasons to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Reasons to grow, and we might say, well, boy, that's a no-brainer. But Peter gives us some of those reasons. As we saw last week, grace and peace are multiplied to us as we grow. The more we grow, the more grace and peace we experience in our lives. The second thing was that we have all things pertaining to life and godliness. As we grow, Jesus, we draw upon, if you will, the grace of God, and he gives us, he's already given to us everything that you need to live a godly life. That means overcoming anything that you might face. That means those bad habits that you have, you can shed them. That means that your battle with lust, your battle with materialism, your battle with temper, your battle with not being a loving, gracious person, whatever those battles might be, you have everything you need to live a life that brings honor and glory to Christ. You have everything you need to live a life of godliness. And then we looked last week, started looking a little bit at the thing, one of the things that are avoided by growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ is that spiritual myopia and amnesia are avoided. And that myopia, that's an optometrist's term, and it means that you're not short-sighted. Peter talks about being short-sighted where you can't see. You see some people that, that when they're reading anything, they've got to be like this. Why? Because they, they can't see well at all. And we can become short-sighted and forget about the purification of our own sins. We look at other people and we judge other people and we're, we're critical of other people. And why? Because we've forgotten how vile we were. You see, it was your hands that held the hammer that drove those nails into Christ. You say, well, how can you say that? I wasn't even alive then. It was my sin. It was your sin. He died for my sin. That's very personal. And my sin put him on the cross. And whether I see myself as vile or not, is irrelevant because we tend to look and compare ourselves with one another, don't we? Well, I'm not as bad as this one, but I'm not as good as that one. But I'm okay. Here's the standard. And he tells us in Romans chapter 3 that we fall short, way short. That's why we're dependent upon his grace and his mercy every single day of our life. We can become short-sighted. We can get wrapped up in this world and not live for what is going to take place down the line. You know, you're just passing through here. I don't know if you realize that or not. But you're just passing through. Our real home now is up there, wherever there is, in the heavenlies. That's where our real home is. And Christ is getting everything ready for us. And we have to live with an eternal perspective 
Because what is important to Christ is not how many cars you own or how big your house is or how much money you have in your bank account or how many things you amass for yourselves or how much protection you put around yourself. What is important to Christ is people. You. Black, white, purple, pink. It matters not what your color is. It matters not what your economic status is. It matters not what your religious experience is. It matters about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And you either have one or you don't. And if you don't, you need one. And God has called us to be a part of helping ones to come to Christ. One, by sharing the word of God, and two, by living it out so that they see something that they want. There's nothing poorer in this world in so many ways than to hear people say, well, I won't become a Christian. Now, understand, first of all, that's just an excuse. But they say, I won't become a Christian because of if he's a Christian or she's a Christian, I don't want any part of it. What grounds are we giving them for having that attitude? Are we living in such a way that when people look at us, they go, I want what you have. I don't know what it is. It was asked of a man in Russia some years ago, how do you witness? He was a Christian. They said, how do you witness to people in Russia when it's illegal to witness about Christ in Russia. He says, we live in such a way that people are compelled to ask us, what is it? I want what you've got. What is it? And the same truth is what's taking place in China. The Christians there are living such an extraordinary life in their love and their service and everything for other people that people are drawn, they're like magnets. They draw you in because you see something different about them. That should be the testimony of every one of our lives. Failure to grow indicates that we've forgotten why we're, we were redeemed by the blood of Christ. And that's because he wanted a relationship with you. You see, he didn't want to just fill your head with Bible verses and facts. He wants a relationship. And relationships take time and patience and diligence to develop. Ask any one of these young people that got married. They may have thought that they knew the person that they got married to and then they got married and they found out that the person is, there's things that they don't just come together on. Why? Because they're different and it takes time to deal with those differences. It takes time to deal with those cultural differences, not just in cultures from another country or something, but cultures and differences between your house and my house and the way my mom did things and the way that your mom did things. And that relationship has got to grow. And that's why it just blesses my heart when I see somebody 80 or 90 years old and they're walking down the street and they're still holding hands. Or you talk to some old man and you go, how are you doing there, buddy? And he go, looks up at his watch and he's got myopia, by the way. And he's looking real close to see what those little dials say. He goes, it's a quarter after 10. My wife right now, she's making her morning tea. You know, she makes it at a quarter after 10 every day. Then she'll go and she'll sit down with the newspaper and, and he really knows her. He really knows what she's like. He really knows what movies make her cry. What things encourage her and what things discourage her. Why? Because they spent the time building a relationship. Let me ask you, what do you know about your Savior? 
what do you know about this individual that you have supposedly, and I'm not doubting you, I'm just saying supposedly because you have to, to ask yourself the question, the one that you have supposedly come into a relationship with. Now, don't tell me what any pagan on the street can tell me. Oh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, and his mother was Mary, and his father was Joseph, and, you know, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have no idea about Jesus Christ, but they can give you those facts. What is it that makes Jesus' heart beat faster and faster? Does anybody know? And Solomon, he speaks about that. He says, you make my heart beat faster with a single glance. When you just give that glance, it's like looking at your wife across the room and you feel so satisfied that you're in relationship with her. What is it that Jesus gets excited about? What is it that he came for? How important is a soul to Christ? How much does it please him when you see you living your life in a way that brings him honor and glory? When people say, you know, you're just like your Lord chip off the old block. Or like they'd say down here, you're like your daddy. I knew you were a redman. You act just like him. Now that can be scary. <laughs> Especially if you know my kids, because they, when fully, when fully trained, a disciple will be like his teacher. And that's scary. But, you know what? What do you know? What do you know about the one that you have a relationship with? And how deep is that relationship? I can tell you the names of teachers that I had in school. I have that kind of a relationship with them. I know their names. There are other ones that I can tell you how many kids they've got. Other ones that I can tell you what sports teams they have and what makes them laugh and what makes them cry and other ones you know deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and why because you chose to spend time with them you chose to ask questions you chose to get to know them you developed a relationship think about it unless we want to be guilty of forgetfulness and short-sightedness, we need to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that doesn't stop at a certain age. I've known Christ now for over 40 years, and I oftentimes feel like I haven't even gotten to first base yet. First base in my understanding on so many things, and first base in my character. I get frustrated when I get upset about things or whatever, and I go, this is not the way Jesus would have me to be. The fourth thing, the fourth reason that we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ is what he tells us here is that we will never stumble. Think about that now. You will never stumble. Peter says, if these things, if you do these things, in 1 Peter 1.10, he says, if you do these things, and what are the things he's talking about? Is to this add this, to this add this, to this add this, and there's a progression and there's a growth to your faith, you add this quality. And just for an example here, let me get back there. And for this very reason, add to your moral ex, add to your faith. First of all, it starts with faith. To your faith, add moral excellence. To your moral excellence, add knowledge. To your knowledge, add self-control, and so on and so forth. 
So there's a progression, there's an adding to, and all of these things work together to develop that divine nature in you or that Christ-likeness. Peter says, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. If you're diligent to make your calling and election sure, if you add to your faith these virtues, if you abound in these eight graces, Peter says you'd, you'll never stumble. Now understand that this does not mean that you will never sin. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In 1 John 1.10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The word stumble here in the Greek, what it means is to fall into misery, to become wretched. Or as Thayer said, it's like losing your salvation. We will never stumble so bad as to lose our salvation, but if we're not growing in these graces, we will be stumbling and we might seriously doubt our salvation because we look at our own life and we see nothing that resembles growth, nothing that is resembling a Christ-likeness in our life. And sometimes you wonder, did I mean business? Do I have a relationship with God? It's an honest question. This assurance of our salvation is true and we know it's true when we're giving all diligence. Why? We have peace then. We have peace because we know that we're growing with Christ, that we have a relationship with Christ. And we need to grow in the knowledge and therefore make our calling sure. We're, we're at peace with ourselves and at peace with our God. I've talked to ones that have gotten saved. Every time there was a revival or whatever, they've gotten saved again and again and again. They've walked the aisle. Why? Because they've never been assured of their own relationship. You know, I know who I have a relationship with, and I know those that I just know, and I know those that I know a little bit better. You follow me here? I know those that, I, that would lay down their life for me and I for them. I know those that if I was hurting, I could go to them and they wouldn't right away start saying, well, what sin is in your life? They would be going, what can I do to help you? Rather than looking to judge right away, like Job's friends, they'd be going, what can I do? I'm here for you. If you need a shoulder, come cry on mine. If you want to talk, I give you my ear to listen. If you need money, I'll give you whatever I can. If you need help, I'll do my best to give you all the help that I can. Why? Because we have a relationship. The fifth thing, reason, why we need to be growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ is that we have an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom. This everlasting kingdom, if you will, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He says in 2 Peter 1.11, for in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. What does Peter mean here? In 2 Timothy 4.18, it 
It says, the Lord will deliver me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. In other words, what he's referring to as this heavenly kingdom is our ultimate destination. That's our home. Okay? The heavenly kingdom is our place that we're going to. But then he says, he precedes going to the kingdom with these words that say that he will abundantly you will have an abundant entrance. What does that mean? He says that you will be able, that you may be able to enter, not having escaped from a shipwreck, if you will, or from a fire, but as it were, in triumph. You know, it's like we use the word, I got out of there just in the nick of time. This happened by the skin of my teeth. You know those phrases? That's what he's talking about here. You won't make it by the skin of your teeth. You won't just get inside the door. You won't barely get in there empty-handed. And there will be a day when we will receive rewards when we, when we get to heaven. And we'll lay those at the feet of our Lord and Savior. Lord, this is what I found you worthy of. Here's my life. Paul speaks in uh, Corinthians. He says that some will make it basically by the skin of their teeth. They'll just get inside the gate. They'll just make it. They'll go there empty-handed. Nothing to offer up. Are they saved? Yeah. Are they in heaven? Yeah. But can you imagine going to a birthday party and everybody takes a gift and they give it to whoever's birthday it is and then that individual looks at you and you didn't bring anything? Now, it's not because you couldn't afford it. You just look at him and say, well, I didn't like you well enough that I thought it was, you were worthy of a gift. So I'd just come for the food and the cake and the fun. You know, sometimes there are individuals that treat our Lord that way. They've gotten saved They've got a little bit of a relationship, a little bit, but they never grow. There won't be any rewards. They'll just make it by the skin of their teeth. They'll have nothing to offer the Lord because down here there was no diligence to grow. There was no diligence to have that relationship grow into something more than it was. <laughs> By possessing these eight graces that we will be looking at, these add-ons, if you will, that Peter exhorts us to add to our life, by possessing these, we will be able to live victoriously. We will be ever increasing. Sometimes, you know, you run into a Christian, you go, well, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with this? How do you, how do you deal with these people that treat you in that way or say these things about you? How do you deal with loving your enemies? You know what? None of us can until we grow. As we're growing, we understand more and more. Of God's character. And as we're growing, we're becoming more and more 
like him in our character. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who loved his appearing. Are you excited about his coming back? Now, don't answer that just because I asked the question, because the answer should be yes. But are you excited about it where it motivates you? Do you know what it's going to be like when he comes back? Do you know who he's coming back for? Do you know how you can overcome until he comes back? You can't answer yes to those questions if you're not growing. Peter was getting ready for his departure when he wrote this letter. Paul, the verses we just read, was getting ready for his departure when he wrote to Timothy. And Paul says, I've finished the course. I've run the race. I've done what God has called me to do. And the question my, I might ask is, are you running the race? First of all, are you running the race or just you know, it's, it's like, are you, are you actively involved or are you just sort of sitting on the premises? You know? You're just kind of there. Growing. It's your call. God doesn't make any one of us grow. He calls you. He shows his love to you. He says, in fact, I, in the book of Isaiah, he says that he demonstrates his love for us. The love that he has for us, he's demonstrated. It's in the palm of his hands. You know what that is? The nail holes. How much more could God show you, show you that he loves you? God, if you love me, why can't I get my locker open at school? God, if you love me, why do I have cancer? God, if you love me, why do you let these people say such nasty things about me at work? What can God do to show you how much he loves you more than he's already done? When God gave his one and only to die, to be whipped and beaten beyond recognition at the hands of people just like you and I, and he did that because of his love for you and I. If we focus on how much he's loved us, does that not motivate us? Should that not motivate us to grow in that relationship with him? Are these reasons here that Peter gives, are they not sufficient are they not sufficient enough reasons to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? For through such knowledge, grace and peace are multiplied. All things pertaining to life and godliness are provided. Spiritual myopia and amnesia are avoided. We will never stumble. And an abundance entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our God will be ours. Why? Because such knowledge requires the development of these eight graces that we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks. And 
in conjunction with each other. They all work together. You know, much like our body does. Not only the spiritual body, but even, you know, maybe a more, uh, better illustration that we can all understand is our physical body. You know, when one part of our physical body suffers, we all suffer. If you don't believe that, let me hit you on the toe with a hammer and you tell me if your whole body isn't in pain. It does. And when you have a headache, your whole body doesn't want to do anything. And when you have nerve damage or something in a limb and that limb doesn't function properly, it affects the whole body. You see, this body was, this physical body was designed to work together, each part supplying what it was designed to do. And these eight graces work together, designed to accomplish something in our life, and that something is Christ-likeness. but we have to develop them with all diligence. With all diligence. And these eight graces will work together to develop Christ-like character in our lives. Your call. Your call. You choose. You either grow in these or you don't. But understand that your decision will dramatically affect the way that you live the rest of your life, however long or however short that might be. It will affect the way you're able to handle such things. that come along, whether they be disease or whether they be financial hardship or uh, relationships, whatever it might be. The way that we deal with the circumstances in our life are directly related to the person that we are and are becoming. And one of these days, you're going to present that person to Jesus Christ. Here, Lord, the gift that you gave to me, eternal life, I give back to you in a reflection of your son. Think about it. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the time together this morning. We pray once again, Father, asking you to work diligently, Lord, in our lives, and I pray, Father, that during this week ahead that we would consider these things and next week as we start looking at these individual eight graces that you would give us the desire to really grow in each one and let them do their work in us in a mighty way that we might reflect your son for it's in Christ's name we pray.